Chapter 13 of Hind Swaraj, or Indian Home Rule. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Shipp. Hind Swaraj, or Indian Home Rule, by Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Chapter 13 what is true civilization? Reader You have denounced railways, lawyers and doctors. I can see that you will discard all machinery. What, then, is civilization? Editor The answer to that question is not difficult. I believe that the civilization India has evolved is not to be beaten in the world. Nothing can equal the seeds sown by our ancestors. Rome went, Greece shared the same fate, the might of the pharaohs was broken, Japan has become westernized, of China nothing can be said, but India is still, somehow or other, sound at the foundation. The people of Europe learn their lessons from the writings of the men of Greece or Rome, which exist no longer in their former glory. In trying to learn from them, the Europeans imagine that they will avoid the mistakes of Greece and Rome. Such is their pitiable condition. In the midst of all this, India remains immovable, and that is her glory. It is a charge against India that her people are so uncivilized, ignorant and stolid that it is not possible to induce them to adopt any changes. It is a charge really against our merit. What we have tested and found true on the anvil of experience, we dare not change. Many thrust their advice upon India, and she remains steady. This is her beauty. It is the sheet anchor of our hope. Civilization is that mode of conduct which points out to man the path of duty. Performance of duty and observance of morality are convertible terms. To observe morality is to attain mastery over our mind and our passions. So doing, we know ourselves. The Gujarati equivalent for civilization means good conduct. If this definition be correct, then India, as so many writers have shown, has nothing to learn from anybody else, and this is as it should be. We notice that mind is a restless bird. The more it gets, the more it wants and still remains unsatisfied. The more we indulge our passions, the more unbridled they become. Our ancestors, therefore, set a limit to our indulgences. They saw that happiness was largely a mental condition. A man is not necessarily happy because he is rich, or unhappy because he is poor. The rich are often seen to be unhappy, the poor to be happy. Millions will always remain poor. Observing all this, our ancestors dissuaded us from luxuries and pleasures. We have managed with the same kind of plough as it existed thousands of years ago. We have retained the same kind of cottages that we had in former times, and our indigenous education remains the same as before. We have had no system of life-corroding competition. Each followed his own occupation or trade and charged a regulation wage. It was not that we did not know how to invent machinery, but our forefathers knew that, if we set our hearts after such things, we would become slaves and lose our moral fibre. They therefore, after due deliberation, decided that we should only do what we could with our hands and feet. They saw that our real happiness and health consisted in a proper use of our hands and feet. They further reasoned that large cities were a snare and a useless encumbrance, and that people would not be happy in them, that there would be gangs of thieves and robbers, prostitution and vice flourishing in them, and that poor men would be robbed by rich men. They were, therefore, satisfied with small villages. They saw that kings and their swords were inferior to the sword of ethics, and they, therefore, held the sovereigns of the earth to be inferior to the rishis and the fakirs. A nation with a constitution like this is fitter to teach others than to learn from others. This nation had courts, lawyers and doctors, but they were all within bounds. 
everybody knew that these professions were not particularly superior moreover these vakils and vaids did not rob people they were considered people's dependents not their masters justice was tolerably fair the ordinary rule was to avoid courts there were no touts to lure people into them this evil too was noticeable only in and around capitals the common people lived independently and followed their agricultural occupation they enjoyed true home rule and where this cursed modern civilization has not reached india remains as it was before the inhabitants of that part of india will very properly laugh at your new-fangled notions the english do not rule over them nor will you ever rule over them those whose name we speak we do not know nor do they know us i would certainly advise you and those like you who love the motherland to go into the interior that has yet not been polluted by the railways and to live there for six months you might then be patriotic and speak of home rule now you see what i consider to be real civilization those who want to change conditions such as i have described are enemies of the country and are sinners reader it would be all right if india were exactly as you have described it but it is also india where there are hundreds of child widows where two-year-old babies are married where twelve-year-old girls are mothers and housewives where women practice polyandry where the practice of neog obtains where in the name of religion girls dedicate themselves to prostitution and where in the name of religion sheep and goats are killed do you consider these also symbols of the civilization that you have described editor you make a mistake the defects that you have shown are defects nobody mistakes them for ancient civilization they remain in spite of it attempts have always been made and will be made to remove them we may utilize the new spirit that is born in us for purging ourselves of these evils but what i have described to you as emblems of modern civilization are accepted as such by its votaries the indian civilization as described by me has been so described by its votaries in no part of the world and under no civilization have all men attained perfection the tendency of indian civilization is to elevate the moral being that of the western civilization is to propagate immorality the latter is godless the former is based on a belief in god so understanding and so believing it behoves every lover of india to cling to the old indian civilization even as a child clings to its mother's breast. End of chapter 13